Well, the thing with gold is, you know, I have it in my vault in London, yeah. right? And you're a buyer in New York. Are you going to get, or, or, you know, somewhere internationally, or, you know, I'm a buyer in New York and my gold's in Chicago. And are you going to demand custody of it? I mean, maybe if you want to hire a, you know, an armed, <laughs> an armed brigade to yeah. give you the gold and you store it in your vault and men with guns and Bitcoin, it's, it's, you know, it cost two bucks to move a billion yeah. and it's verifiable and you have custody mathematically in 10 minutes and even, yeah. even quicker. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Dylan LeClaire. Robert. To the What Is Money show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Great to have you here. Uh, we are in Riga for the Baltic Honey Badger Conference. Uh, my first time here. Your first time here? Yep. Uh, great group of Bitcoiners. Um, this, we've taken up the interrogation rooms that turned into a podcast studio to have a conversation. First time on the show, right? First time. Awesome. Great to have you here and love to do it in person. Just by way of quick introduction, you are the Director of Market Intelligence at UTXO Management and you're the co-founder of 21st Paradigm. Um, You've become pretty well known as being the young macro genius guy. So uh, definitely a lot to talk about in regards to Bitcoin and macro. I'm not sure where we should start, but maybe we could just talk about the halving that's upon us. Yep. I think it's end of March, 2024, roughly. Yep. March, April, um, estimate, but yeah. What are you, I guess my first question is, do you, are you still, are you a proponent that the having is still a significant contributor to the price cycle of Bitcoin and yes or no. And then what do you actually expect to see play out, uh, up to the having and then typically price peaks, what, six to nine months after. So what do you, what do you see happening in the Bitcoin market space Yeah, through the having? Yeah, no, I, I, so uh, I'll offer somewhat of a contrarian take. And I said this yesterday on a panel. Um, it was a real cool moment for me. It was on a panel with like Adam Back and Turtle Meester and um, a few others and uh, in front of the, the audience on the main stage. And they asked the same question of like, hey, how do, how do we think of the halving? Um, and Adam was ultra bullish. I uh, was saying, you know, 100K before the halving, which was uh, certainly an interesting perspective. Um, but I, I'm in the opinion that the, at the current time, uh, maybe not in previous cycles, um, the having is somewhat of a diminishing effect, right? As you know, the supply reduction, you know, the the relative amount of issuance that gets cut is 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 in half every single time. 
Um, and so I think paradoxically, everybody said it's a slot, it's a supply of event and at the margin it is, mm-hmm. you know, the supply, you know, at the margin going from 900 Bitcoin a day to 450 matters in mm-hmm. issuance. Uh, but I think it's more of a demand driver par- paradoxically. Mm-hmm. And here's why is that, um, the having the flow, I think, is, is much less significant than the stock at this point. Mm-hmm. What's really driving this is net accumulation by hodlers and at the same time, you know, the distribution, right? And this, this is what's kind of driving the boom and bust, right? Using just the having as, you know, this data point every four years as like the single driver of the Bitcoin market, I think, doesn't do justice to just how much data we have at our disposal. Like there's so much data, whether it's UTXO set data, or like global macro data as Bitcoin increasingly becomes entrenched um, in this global financial system that points to like Bitcoin being much more than just like, a oh, having, you know, press the green button up on. Right, 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 right. And so I think when I say it's a demand event, I say, you know, regardless of whatever Fed policy was doing last time in 2020, May of 2020, it was the money printer go burr. It was like the perfect narrative mm-hmm. of oh my gosh, you know, quantitative tightening, supply having, algorithmic monetary policy, nobody can do anything to change it. Um, this time, I think it, you know, regardless of, of what the global macro situation looks like, I think it'll probably be a bit different, but that's still guesswork, you know, um, being this far ahead of time. It's, it's going to be bigger, I think, from like a cultural perspective and just an awareness perspective. Mm-hmm. Last time, like it did get a little bit of mainstream attention, but it's still just kind of like, our little niche corner of the internet that was like, oh, the having, let's have a live stream. It wasn't like global news. And not necessarily that this one will be global yeah. news, but it'll be relatively a larger event. And yeah. whether the BOJ is printing or the ECB is, is you know, Christine Lagarde is opining on some, you know, esoteric monetary policy or whatever Jerome Powell is saying, Bitcoin's having and nobody can change that. And yeah. so I think, you know, as when supply is as tightly constrained as it is this ha- this time around as it was last time around and you know i think more so you know th- three years or so after the bust phase mm-hmm. of the bitcoin market is really like that's kind of lined up very nicely with the halvings mm-hmm. and so you know maybe the halving was a driver maybe not maybe it was global liquidity maybe a bit of both but that's when you know something like a deba- a demand spark can really like ignite the market right like like the supply was so primed you had all this Kindling and you know, in May of 2020, and all it took was you know Sailor and Grayscale Bitcoin Trust to or just a couple hundred thousand Bitcoin, and the market cap goes to a trillion, right? Yeah. So I think we're in a similar position, but it's it's a matter of if we get the the spark. Gotcha. Yeah, it's an interesting take. Um, the supply side, the supply shock, is a very easily understandable narrative. But you also like this idea of um, people like having the demand for it based on, I guess, the historical price action relative to the having. So they're just basically buying it in anticipation of price action rhyming with the past. But then that can actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy as demand comes and then the price action reflects that. And then people are like, oh, wow, this thing's repeating. I've often wondered that if that Cycle, whether it's supply driven or demand driven, obviously a little bit of both, but to the extent that that continues to repeat and that we do see price action superimposed on this halving cycle with like clockwork fidelity, yep. at what point do people just start front running this thing? And you start to see the whole, like the you would expect the curve to kind of shift closer to the halving instead of the peaking six to nine months after. People are like, well, look, it's done it, it's done it five times now. Let me just go ahead and buy it now. And you see an earlier price peak. Yeah, and so there's a, it's just a strange self-fulfilling prophecy aspects to Bitcoin that I wrestle with in my mind. Like, whether it's supply-driven or demand-driven, I think at some point people are going to start to front run it. Yep. Yeah, I mean, what if that's already happening? Yeah, it is it by is. some of us, right? right? Yeah. I think that the you know we what we can't factor in is there's still a massive information asymmetry, yeah. right? Really, like regardless of the having of just like you know fundamental Bitcoin mechanics. So like you talk to a really s- smart investor or you know you know, Silicon Valley tech VC yeah. that you would expect to be, you know, relatively familiar with these basic concepts. And they go, oh, well, what if the 21 million has changed? Right. Like, I, right, like, right, it's, right. like it's a gotcha state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's hmm. people, people say like, you know, education, education, education. And from like an outsider's perspective, they're like, oh, what are you pitching a Ponzi? Yeah. You know, that's like the kind of the misinformed view of, of 
what we mean by education. And we're like, no, you just actually don't have an understanding of what this thing is. So yeah. the having, yeah, the having can be a spark, I think. But what really is like priming these cycles post bus, like why does Bitcoin go randomly parabolic every three or four years? Well, yeah, the having, you know, has actually been very like cyclical in that regard and, and rhymed right with it, with the run up of these cycles. But it's more so a bunch of really, really orange filled Bitcoiners that just hoard all the supply so tight mm -hmm. that all it takes is just a little bit mm. of demand. And then, you know, whether it's, you know, kind of a reflexive feedback loop, yeah. um, you know, growing adoption, network effect, Lindy, you know, Bitcoin just kind of just like the education component, more people adopting it. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's just this feedback loop and it reaches an exhaustion point when two things happen. Well, I guess you could almost say it's one thing, but it's price runs up so high that the people that have been hoarding the thing for the last two, three, four years, the people that are buying Bitcoin when it's down 80%, down 70%, yeah. down 60% from the highs, you know, the people that aren't shaken out, like, yeah, well, maybe, like, I, I want a house. I want, you know, I want something nice. Like, money is, is just a means to an end, yeah. right? Like, I get the whole, like, Bitcoin is, you know, like, this kind of religious thing. Like, mm -hmm. I, I get it all. Yeah. I, I truly do. But money is just a means to an end, sure. right? And so, like, if you're not going to spend it, that's your choice. But yeah. that's what money is for, right? It's just, just to receive, store, and you know, transfer value. Yeah. And so what do they do? The, the others take a little bit off the top and the, yeah. the supply transfers from strong hands to weak hands yeah. and buy, and, and, you know, the, the speculative mania of buyers just gets exhausted. And so price usually what collapses yeah. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70%. And all of a sudden we've bottomed at two, three, four, five X the previous, you know, mania high or right around it. Right. Like, Bitcoin's dead right now. It's yeah. 26,000. Right. This is five, six years ago. The absolute mania bubble unsustainable high was 20,000. Yeah. And so people will look at the linear chart and they'll always say either, well, Bitcoin's dead mm -hmm. or this is a massive bubble. Right. With no fundamental yeah. understanding of like, well, it's not this binary thing. And actually, if you yeah. understand this trend and you, maybe you flip it to log scale, it's like, yeah. I feel like it shouldn't be that hard of a concept. Yeah. But that's what's playing out. And only like a, you know, a relatively small group of people actually can see that. Yeah. And all of it's, I guess, further fueled by mainstream media misinformation about it. So people just always think it's a joke when they don't do the work. Yep. Um, okay. Do you think, so obviously fiat currency, something we talk about a lot on the show, typically has kind of this natural life cycle that always ends in really the same way. It either hyperinflates or some other fiat state conquers the existing fiat state and they move to the new currency. Yeah. Um, pretty much the only way these things go. Yep. Do you think that we need um, fiat systems to go into decline for Bitcoin to succeed? I mean, not go, they're always in decline. To fail, like, do we need U.S. dollar hyperinflation? Do we need British pound hyperinflation? Things like that for Bitcoin to fully monetize, or, or is are these two distinct events that don't necessarily need to coincide? That's a really interesting question. I, well, no, I guess on the on the surface level, um, but I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive, um, given the circumstances, but. With the current state of things, and uh, you know, I'm not saying hyperinflation happens tomorrow, but like I would be bullish on Bitcoin even if, if it existed in a state where global debt to GDP wasn't 400 percent, mm -hmm. and U.S. debt to GDP wasn't 125 percent, mm -hmm. and you know there wasn't a Ponzi scheme of of entitlements and unfunded liabilities coming down the pipe in every developed nation on the planet. Mm -hmm. But those things all do exist. Mm -hmm. Um, like I would be, I would be bullish on, on Bitcoin regardless, just given its emergent properties and its, and its, you know, dominant monetary properties compared to everything else. Yeah. It's absolutely scarce. It has a rising marginal production cost. It's, it's, you know, we know all the things I can, we can go to this. <laughs> but, but the fiat state does matter actually. And it's actually, I think, you know, actually speeding up the adoption. It's not, it's not a coincidence in my opinion. And I would, Maybe guess you say the same that Satoshi released Bitcoin, you know, in the midst or shortly after Lehman and the financial crisis, mm -hmm. right? It seems like you know whether that was a coincidence or not. Uh, 
you know, there's some significance there. Yeah. Like, hey, I, and he even writes about it. He's like, hey, I have a solution to the ills of fiat currency. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they create these credit bubbles that go bust. You can't trust mm-hmm. centralized intermediaries. And so, like, if we just think about the history of money, what is money? Yeah. Uh, and I have no idea. <laughs> and, we, and we just look, even in the past hundred years, I mean, there's, there's thousands of years of history. We can look at, like, you know, even Chinese dynasties. But mm-hmm. just in recent U.S. history, right? And this isn't just the U.S., centric view this is global but right like what happens when these debt bubbles burst right like on a similar question is it a coincidence that world wars happen when debt levels get to the you know to the tipping point 120 percent, 140 percent world war currency reset will yeah. reestablish it financial repression right mm-hmm. like is that a coincidence is it a coincidence that you know after 11, 12 years of QE, zero rates, money printing around the planet, the yield curve inverts, the repo market blows up, mm-hmm. and COVID comes out of nowhere. Right. And like, am I a conspiracy theorist for that, for saying, or suggesting such a thing? Oh, maybe not, but it, it, it lined up really well, mm-hmm. right? And they printed trillions of dollars. BlackRock comes out in 2019 and says, well, in the next, in the next recession, in the next downturn, there's going to need, need to be direct payments the households and businesses to keep this this thing going uh-huh. and then they you know within a year tens of trillions of dollars are printed yeah. so you know is that a cause and effect or is this just the, the natural order of of how these systems you know try to survive into their last you know diet in, in, in a dying state mm-hmm. that's that's a rabbit hole in of it yeah that's a great it's a great question and it's great framing too because we have all of these narratives about history that we're fed and told and we've learned in school and, you know, one that actually doing this show, you know, we learned, I attended school in Tennessee growing up, the Civil War, the U.S. Civil War was all about slavery, right? Abraham Lincoln was coming to free the slaves and we bad Southerners had slaves in bondage and that's what the whole war was about. And then I have Dominic Frisby on the show, he's like, no. It's about taxation, right? How do you, the tax base, the population was disproportionately in the North, but the tax base was disproportionately in the South. South wanted to secede peacefully. North didn't like that. North basically sparks off the war to justify um, keeping their tax base. So like we, if you start looking through the lens of money, you can understand world affairs much more practically and pragmatically than you can trying to digest it through these narratives that, that we've... <laughs> been given so I, I think it's your point on like world war one and world war two it's like when debt levels get really high right people start to scramble for the means and that scrambling often involves armed conflict so it's a very useful prism through which to look at the world maybe maybe it's a topic for another show but uh all, along those lines you sh- it's a it's a rabbit hole to look at uh states nations that try to uh set up uh to try to get away from like the global banking complex mm-hmm. and set up state right. state banks, um, or, or you know outside the independent of independent banks, yeah. No. And what happens to those nations when they try to to get away from that system? Mm. Um, and this is you know a recent phenomenon, and this is a you know we can go back hundreds of years. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's it's quite alarming. Um, Do you think El Salvador is going to be in the crosshairs or something like that? I mean, we see the media propaganda, right? It, you know, they don't, they don't have a clear reason to, uh, you know, bring a military presence at the current time. Like that, it wouldn't be politically palatable to do so. So it's just like a smear campaign, right? Which is like kind of the first level of, yeah. of you know, propaganda. The thing yeah. to throw at them is just smear campaigns and downgrading their credit rating, right? right. Like that's like level one. Yeah. You know, level ten is, you know, drone strikes. Right. Um, and obviously, like, there's no, like, there's no appetite for that, at least, you know, currently. And so, so who knows? But, you know, Bukele saying to the IMF, you know, buzz off. Yeah. Like, the, 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 the U.S. empire, um, the, the banking uh, affairs institutions, uh, you know, are they all one institution? You know, that's a topic for debate as well. But yeah. They don't. They, they don't like that. The incumbent interests don't like that. Yeah, well, it's at least a cartel, 
Yeah. Right. And so, um, like is the BOJ and the ECB and the yeah. fed, are they really independent? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question either. It's kind of like asking, I mean, there's different degrees of independence, but there's also corroboration between them. There has to be some degree of it. Otherwise, um, game theory wouldn't really work, you know, kind of like drug cartels, you know, they respect certain rules of engagement or this is our territory that we get to sell to central banks. Like this is our territory that we get to inflate, but then the U S is the center or the top of the whole heap, right? They can yeah. inflate everybody. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know that it's all essentially a coordinated thing, but it's definitely cartelized just yeah. like the illicit drug markets. Um, which is a great comparison, actually, because fiat currency is one hell of a drug uh, that apparently all humans are addicted to. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code Bitcoin23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Shifting gears a little bit, what, just like general macro macro overview, 2023, we're sitting in almost quarter four, 2023. Um, it's been a rough few years post-pandemic. Um, where do you see things where they sit currently, where do you think we're headed? Um, I think the Fed is still tightening yep. right now. Um, I'm seeing videos. Of, these things are going viral on, on Instagram recently, just men and women that earn median wages, you know, 30, 40, $50 an hour saying they can't make ends meet, you know, having these emotional rants, they're going super viral. The Oliver Anthony song, right. Kind of singing to the the plight of, of the, the blue collar worker in today's environment. Feels like things are kind of coming apart a little bit. Um, what, how do you see things and where are things headed from a macro economic standpoint? Yeah. I mean, bigger picture society is definitely like fraying at the seams. Um, you know, the, the rise of populism and kind of like class warfare, which I think the media likes to portray as like a race thing or a us versus them thing. And it's as really like, a class thing and and it's you know, it's because of wealth disparity mm -hmm. right like you know these big kind of cycles of you know a long-term debt cycle but also kind of like these fourth turnings and political movements and the rise of, of radical extremism on on both ends um is core is very much correlated with wealth disparity but i guess zooming in a little bit more um if we think okay 2023 um i kind of brief uh just like briefly mentioned 2019 you know everybody like the, the leading indicators macro wise are saying okay we're gonna have a recession and mm -hmm. you know they're in the middle of a tightening cycle rates are already you know rates barely get to two and a half percent for the the corporate bond market freezes up mm -hmm. you know the vix spikes and you know, get in they start cutting rates before the, they don't you know this isn't a narrative they cut rates before the pandemic right mm -hmm. they they topped in the in the tightening cycle and started cutting mm -hmm. and if you just look at like fed tightening cycles right just look at them like never mind COVID, because everybody is like oh fed pivot up only and, you know we're, we're all going to make it money for to go burn mm -hmm. um if you just look at like the previous asset boom and bust cycles and i you know i should remind you that like if it's in the central bank minutes post-mortem that these central bankers are purposefully creating asset bubbles because of the keynesian like wealth effect mm -hmm. you just listen to what greenspan said and he was like right. well the, the tech bubble burst we're, we're actually looking to directly stimulate housing Mm -hmm. And they did. <laughs> um, and so 2019, right? Starts, we start to see a slowdown. Bond markets freeze up a bit. Repo market blows up. The Fed starts inflating its balance sheet with repo market interventions, which is not QE. In fall of 2019, the markets, markets just float upwards. 
volatility collapses, Fed balance sheet, look at look look at the date, it's creeping up again before COVID, right? Mm-hmm. The, the the taper in the Fed balance sheet was going to be like watching paint dry. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, mm-hmm. right? So all of a sudden, you know, January, February, March comes, COVID, they print a bunch of money. If we look at what the the IMF, these you know these bankers were saying in the middle of the 2010s, post GFC, rates are still zero, money printer go burr, inflation can't manifest. That what they say is the only way to get out of these this this debt bubble, this sovereign debt bubble, mm-hmm. this everything bubble in debt burdens, is is essentially re- uh, financial repression. Mm-hmm. It's a sustained. They 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 map it out. It's in the abstract of an academic yeah. IMF paper. Right. It's and they give historical examples, and they basically say it's, a, it's the only way to get out of it is a wealth transfer from, from creditors. Yeah. And and how do we do it? A sustained burst, usually an unexpected burst of high inflation, right? Mm. With yields capped artificially low, right? Mm. So 2020, if you look post post COVID, post the announcement of buying uh, junk, you know, corporate bonds, post money printer go burr. I mean, they're still printing, but you see the ECB governors, you see the Fed governors. Actively going out, going on CNBC saying, yeah, we actually need inflation to run pretty hot. Mm. They changed their 2% inflation target to average inflation targeting, right? To, mm. to, to kind right. of, you know, they're trying to let inflation go uncapped, right? This is like classic central planning, right? Yeah. Micromanage a CPI index. Sure. Well, they got it, right? Yeah. And, I, and in my opinion, this is just my opinion, it could, could be wrong. I think whether they weren't expecting a political pressure or it was just so intense that they couldn't manage it the goal like if they did it right and not right because it would have hurt a whole bunch of people Mm -hmm. middle and lower class especially and it and it did Mm -hmm. just like you referred to but if they could have had it their way they would have let inflation rip and keep ripping and kept yields low Mm -hmm. so and and intentionally because real debt to gdp or debt to gdp ratio went from like 130 Mm -hmm. to i think like 116 one like it it got it, it did go lower and it didn't go lower because they, they stopped spending. It didn't go lower because they stopped issuing debt. It went lower because because nominal productivity inflation ripped. Nominal GDP ripped and debt burdens ripped, but less. Yeah. And so I think that that was the plan. And what they didn't expect everywhere in Western nations was the political just like you know, left and right, you know, just flaming Jerome Powell, Christine Lagarde. The political pressure was massive. Yeah. And so they always like they had this plan. And on, in paper, you know, in academia, it was the perfect plan. Mm. It's like, we're just going to devalue. They're not going to notice it. We're going to keep yields low. Yeah. Right? They were like zero rates till 2024, right? Mm. And imagine if inflation was 8 9 10% for four years. They could, I mean, they wouldn't have got out of it, but, you know, who knows? It, it, it. Debt to GDP at 80%, which is more manageable, right? Yeah. Um, but it didn't work like that. And so we see the fastest tightening cycle in history, mm-hmm. zero to 5%. But inflation was still what? And that was a response to those political pressures. In your yeah, in my, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think if you just kind of look at, you know, what they were saying about the yeah. independent Fed, right? Um, and, you know, there was like this kind of class warfare played into it to a certain extent, like the politicalization of it. Whereas with, with you know, the Trump era, when inflation and CPI was one, 2%, mm-hmm. Trump's like, Look at our Fed. Why Europe has negative rates? Why don't we? Yeah, right? he's like stupid Jerome. Right, and and then it turned to Jerome. Inflation is ten percent, and we have so many poor and middle class people that are hurting. Mm-hmm. And both left and right were attacking it. So we see a tightening cycle. But throughout all of twenty twenty two, even though long duration debt, you know, bust the biggest biggest drawdown in a hundred years, mm-hmm. inflation was still. And technically, like the bond market people would get mad at me for using a trailing 12-month inflation reading mm-hmm. with current or forward yields. Mm-hmm. But a Fed's fund rate at 5% when inflation is 8 isn't tight monetary policy. Right. It's still a negative, you know, real yield. Yes. And so for the for the longest time in 2022, with I mean, we supposedly had tight policy, you know, inflation was still running higher than yields. And yeah. just recently. You know, we started to see the labor market cool a bit. Mm-hmm. CPI, PCE, however you want to measure it. Fall, energy prices fall. I mean, they drained the SPR to do it. But mm-hmm. but we've seen we've seen inflation come down while rates are still five, five and five and change percent, five and a half percent. So now monetary policy, if we're just looking at it, you know, 
what maybe forward one year inflation, or you can do trailing one year inflation. Um, forward one year inflation expectations. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's the tightest policy we've seen in 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Basically, right before the massive bust in the great financial crisis, mm -hmm. before the tech bubble. So, tightest policy we've seen in decades. And now the narrative is like, well, you know, they've almost done it, right? The same Fed that was saying, okay, we want inflation to run hot, just, just you know, a little hot, not too hot, is now saying to get to fight inflation, we just want to create a little bit of weakness in the labor market. Not a lot of weakness, <laughs> but a little bit. A little we, bit of unemployment. A little bit of unemployment yeah. because we're going to combat inflation. So it's going to be a net benefit. Um, and I think this is, you know, in essence... Big picture, this is the central banking, central planning hubris, mm -hmm. right? Like Soviet style, you know, yeah. lever micro yeah. management of an emergent system that nobody can understand second, right. third, fourth order effects of. Um, but if we're looking at it in the context of like the macro of the next 12 months, you know, what do we see every time we start to see the labor market turn like this? What have we seen the past six, seven times at the yield curve? Mm -hmm. you know, Inverts. three month, 10 year, three month, 30 year in right. words as it does, right? It's, it's not a coincidence that it precedes these economic recessions, yeah. these busts. And so here's another, you know, one more interesting point, and then I'll turn it back to you. Um, there's two times that in 2022 stocks and bonds both fell by 20%. Mm -hmm. Um, and stocks have since, you know, posted a banger rally, AI mania, mm -hmm. tech, you know, tech is back. Mm -hmm. It's all basically multiple expansion, yeah. but bonds haven't rallied. But if we just looked at 2022, there's been two times where stocks and bonds have both had drawdowns of that, of that size. 1932 or 1931, I can't remember correctly. And 1969, mm -hmm. right? So let's think of what happened within 24 months of both of those events. 1930. Three, FDR confiscates the gold, mm -hmm. revalues it higher. What's he doing? Why did he take the gold? Right? What is he doing? He's he's basically devaluing the debt burdens. Yeah. Right? Because gold's the base layer. So he needs to devalue an implicit default. It's it's an implicit default. Yeah. Well, maybe even an explicit default, right? With, yeah, with like that gold, properly. Confiscate the gold, yeah. revalue it higher. I would say that's an explicit default. Yeah. 71, right? What you know, we're spending all this money in Vietnam, France, other nations like, hey, give us our damn gold. Yeah. Nixon's like, oh, well, sorry, guys, this dollar that's as good as gold isn't. Yeah. Right. So we defaulted on our on our debt yeah. explicitly. Now, 50 years post that, every country in the world is on a debt-based fiat currency. And it's not, and I, I'm talking from the American perspective, but it's not an American centric problem it's everywhere right, right. where does the work world reserve currency have the deepest financial markets right. um but long duration debt drew down 30 percent right mm -hmm. we saw multiple banks fail because of this you know all these 60 40 portfolios mm -hmm. these pensions you know are mapped out based on back test of 40 years of a secular bull market mm -hmm. where interest rates go from 20 percent to zero right like this is like the paradigm right it's like no well when stocks fall, bonds rally, mm -hmm. and nobody had in their risk model. What happens when bonds fall and bonds and, and stocks fall at the same time? No, no one, right. no one could have seen this. So right now, the narrative is like, oh, they might have done it. We might get a soft landing, no landing. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, and this is maybe the one thing that could like temporarily change the timing of like the Bitcoin having you know timing or thesis. Mm -hmm. It's like if we see a real meaningful slowdown. And everybody's like, well, first that cut, up only. And I just say, besides COVID, when you look at when Fed cuts rates, mm -hmm. right? It's actually not like uber bullish, long NASDAQ, S&P. The Fed, the Fed cuts. And the things, things start to look bad. Yeah. The labor market gets worse. Yeah. S&P 500 draws down. And they're not drawing down because the Fed cut. They're drawing down because economic conditions are about to take a turn for the worse. Yeah. And all these central planners... Don't understand the second and third and fourth order effects. Mm. So now we have like debt burdens that are higher than they've ever been yeah. in relative terms and absolute terms, obviously. Yeah. We've seen a massive drawdown wealth effect in, in the bond market. You know, equity markets have rallied, um, you know, Bitcoin bust, all this, you know, the speculative VC stuff that's all dried up. And rates are still five and a half percent. They haven't even cut yet. 
And they're just saying, oh, we're going to hold, we're going to hold, we're going to hold. What are they holding for? Mm -hmm. Right. And so in my opinion, we, you know, what's the magnitude of this? What's the timing? I'll, I'll be wrong. Like, I'll be straight up. Like I was a little bit off on my kind of like thesis on the timing of all of this. Mm -hmm. It was obvious to me that there was, there's going to be a bust coming. And I didn't expect the worst year in a, in a hundred years for, for long duration bonds, no. but it made no sense to me that a 30 year fiat currency instrument was trading at a 1% yield. That was right. nonsensical. No. Um, so I still think we see, I guess the long winded answer is I think we see some pain before they, you know, have the green light to, you know, full on, you know, turn the printers on or, you know, cut rates to zero or lower. Um, because I just think of like this policy I, I refer to as like a policy pendulum. And history shows that basically every single time in recent, you know, recent history, they, they let this policy pendulum swing too far in both ways. Mm. They let it swing way too far in the yeah. upside, tech bubble, you know, just massive, massive wealth effect, speculative mania. Right. And then they say, oh, we got we to curl it back, raise rates, bust, NASDAQ down 80%. Mm. The recession wasn't even bad in 2000 and the S&P went down 55%. Right. Right. Like, like no one talks about that. Um, so like housing, same thing, 2008, right? Everybody's rich, you know, yeah. everybody's a real estate investor. Yeah. So, you know, we've already, we've already, like people think we've seen the bust, you know, 2022 was the bust. Mm -hmm. And now like we're back to the normal up only like mm -hmm. secular growth yeah, yeah, yeah. phase again. And I, I think that may be a little bit um, optimistic, I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, I mean, you would expect to see a flavor of recession like we saw in 01, 08 in front of us. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, right now it's essentially been, if we're thinking of like how we think of a recession, it's been like kind of a white collar recession, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the blow of tech companies. I mean, that makes sense. I think it's yeah. a naturally like re you know a correction to yeah. anything, um, a return to the norm. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe AI like actually does play into that. Yeah. Um, of like, well, do we you know? And I say this as a remote worker, like, but do we need all those email jobs? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Right. Not. Right. Um, but yeah, I I just look at the history of these boom and bust cycles and. Um, it's human psychology plays a, a big component to it, mm. obviously. But I mean, the if you just look at the lever of monetary policy, that's straight up engineered, mm -hmm. right? So I think there's a there's an interplay between the engineering of the cycles and the actual human psychology component. And there's like feedback loops of, you know, oh, okay, money printer go burr. This is you know, buy everything, long everything, yeah. and anything. Business is booming, and it is. And it eventually gets to a point where it's no longer like a, a sustainable story. Yeah. And this isn't just like the 2021 bubble, the everything bubble. This isn't just the previous. This is like, I guess, an archetype for like markets to assets yeah. and markets and yeah. business cycles in general. I think a business cycle would exist in the absence of, of a centrally planned cost. That's right. Cycle. But it exacerbates. It exacerbates. Yeah, it, for right? sure. They're trying to manually be like, no. oh, the price of money is 5% today. No. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's actually, okay, we're going to put it to four, three, two, uh, you know, that's what they right. did in 08, right? Yeah. If you just look at it, it's like, oh, five, they hold it for a little bit. And that's like zero almost immediately. Right. And so in my opinion, like this time, who knows where interest rates go? Who knows at what level the S&P 500 draws down or in yeah. employment, right? Like, and you see a lot of with, with these data points, they're like, oh, we added 300,000 jobs. And then every month for the last eight months, They've revised the number lower. Right. Right. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. take the econ data right. and all this stuff. Like from that sense, you know, the macro stuff is a little bit like, it's like, it's not tea leaves, but it's like, you know, these, the, these are, you know, these are people that have maybe misaligned incentives, maybe not. The data gets revised, you know, mm -hmm. who, how are we going to, you know, read Jerome Powell's tone of voice. Mm -hmm. But I like to not zoom in that far, but just take a little step back and be like, well, Okay, well, these cycles have occurred for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. We know how this ends, and is is this time the anomaly mm. of like you know this the cyclicality of a of a of a debt cycle? And I don't think it is. That's great points and well said. Um, now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. 
Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. This other area that is confusing for a lot of people, derivative markets. Yep. So a lot of people, I uh, hear it a lot from Bitcoin bears, they just say, oh, government's going to just control Bitcoin price and the paper markets. They'll never let it get above X and that's that. Yep. Um, Obviously, it's not that simple. So, like, how how do you unpack? How do you see derivatives playing into the Bitcoin market overall? Is it being used for manipulation, suppression, et cetera? And if so, like, how do you unpack how those mechanics actually work? Yep. Because it's not just as easy as press short and Bitcoin price go down. Right? There's some real market activity that has to take place. You have to own the underlying, et cetera. So, how do you kind of demystify that for for the common man? Yeah, so I guess let's let's like you know unpack, peel back the onion of like what is a derivative or a futures contract. Um, traditionally, for a regular commodity, futures contracts are you know I guess I would explain it like I'm an oil producer. I you know drill into the ground and get barrels of oil. Um, the oil price is pretty volatile, so I you know I don't know what my revenue is going to be like next year or how much I'm going to sell this barrel of oil in six months. And on the other side, you have suppliers you know that have petroleum oil as an input. And they also don't want to just go into the market they did the day they need it and pay the price. Mm -hmm. So there's a futures market. I could say, hey, I'm going to sell this price of oil, this barrel of oil in March 2024 for $82, right? And on the other side, there's a, there's a buyer. For every buyer, there's a seller, mm -hmm. right? And so this is called like, you know, this there's quarterly futures, there's monthly futures, and every commodity you can think of has a futures market in all sorts of jurisdictions, not just the US-based thing. Copper, soybeans, gold, oil, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, so Bitcoin has this, and the interesting thing with commodities is like they have, they all have the production costs, but you have to transport them, you have to hold them, you have to store them. There's like input costs there. So that's all factored into how these futures price trade, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's why, for instance, a barrel of oil went to negative $37 during COVID right. because there was, there was all of this storage that was full and nobody could, could take the oil. So they literally paid people to take it. Mm -hmm. Like everybody needs oil to live, why would it go negative? It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how, you know, this is kind of the mechanics of a futures market. Mm -hmm. um, so Bitcoin, right? This digital synthetic monetary commodity as a futures market, um, right? Like a spot market's re relatively intuitive. I have a dollar of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. you have a dollar. We swap, mm -hmm. right? One to one. Um, and that's, you know, pretty simple to understand. The futures market is a little bit more esoteric. Um, there are calendar futures in Bitcoin, so I can sell a Bitcoin in December of 2023 for a price, but there's also the dominant driver in today's market is a perpetual future, mm -hmm. which is essentially a futures contract that never expires, which is a little bit counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but what it essentially means is I can post collateral, I can post margin, both Bitcoin collateral, and now, uh, you know, in the recent years, there's a proliferation of stablecoin dollar collateralized futures, and I can essentially get... 1x, 1x exposure is essentially kind of like spot. You could think of it as spot. It's still in the futures market, but it's trades like a spot price does. Mm -hmm. 2x leverage would be if Bitcoin's price goes up 50% and I'm long, I'd, I'd double my money. Mm -hmm. right? 10x leverage, Bitcoin price goes up 10%, I double my money. Mm -hmm. right? And so you can do the same thing on the short side. And so what it does is it, I mean, it allows you to hedge, right? But really what it does is it's, it's a lot of speculation, yeah. right? And so what you see during you know the mania, at least in recent times, in the manias of bull markets, you know the peaks, people, you know, in in uh, here's a good example in in April of 2021, the December 2021 futures on FTX, which obviously blew up, mm -hmm. was trading at eighty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Right, so you could sell a Bitcoin for in December when Bitcoin was only sixty thousand for $80,000. And you're like, how does that make sense? 
And that's just people speculating on margin with debt mm-hmm. about the future price. And conversely, when you know the, bear, the the worst of the worst times, you know Bitcoin's price crash post FTX, mm-hmm. the lows of the lows in in these previous cycles, and Bitcoin derivatives only been around for one and a half two cycles. Bitcoin's futures price trades at a, a negative premium to the spot price. Mm-hmm. So the price of Bitcoin is fifteen thousand. Three months out, the price is. 14,500. You're like, how, how does that make sense? You're going to pay me in the future to buy Bitcoin cheaper than it is today? Mm-hmm. It's a backwardation is what it's yeah. called. And so in a traditional commodities, backwardation might make sense. There's a supply glut, storage is full, yeah. whatever the conditions may be. But there's no holding cost to, for Bitcoin, right? So it's kind of, it's, it's more of a pure like speculative premium yeah. or almost like a bearish sort of like Price, yeah. price, this yeah. location. Yeah. But here's the thing that I think is very misunderstood with derivatives, and we'll kind of get to the government perspective, um, is that on a short, really short to medium term, it can drive price volatility. Mm-hmm. Every time you see a, a 20% candle in either direction, that's not because a bunch of people decided to buy Bitcoin at once, mm-hmm. right? It's a derivative dislocation. Either most of the time people want a long Bitcoin, so it's crashing. Or sometimes, like if you think of what's a good example, uh, like April of tw- uh, 2019, Bitcoin's at 3,000. Mm-hmm. Post 2017, it's dead, minus 85%. Mm-hmm. It's done nothing for the month yeah. on end. And then within a month, it's trading at like 10,000, mm-hmm. right? And one of those candles was like a 25% daily candle. It was like mm-hmm. 3,500 to 5,000 or something. Mm-hmm. Though There weren't any, I mean, there were some, but there weren't any buyers there. Mm-hmm. What were they? It was short, people shorting Bitcoin that were forced buyers, mm. right? So there was no new net buying of Bitcoin yeah. that happened then. It was people that had s- sold the asset waiting to buy a lower and it didn't go lower. Mm. So derivatives, for every short, there's a long. For every long, there's a short. So on a net basis, derivatives are net neutral. It's a, it's a, a zero-sum game. You can maybe even say it's a negative-sum game for the participant yeah. because of fees, yeah. right? But on a net basis, like... For instance, I like to use the example of like a very illiquid shit coin as an example of this to, to kind of um, contextualize it. You know, there's, there's this illiquid altcoin that nobody really buys. It has no real volume. If a bunch of people log on to Binance and long it on margin, you know, press market buy with margin 10x mm-hmm. and there's a massive candle to the upside. Are they all rich? Right? On paper they are. But the minute one of them tries to sell, there's no real liquidity there. And it's basically a game of musical chairs to get out. And when, if and when they try to get out, the price is going to collapse right to where it was or even lower, right? So just a couple of days ago, GBTC news, right? Market's bullish, mm-hmm. straight up. And what do, what do we see? The infamous Bitcoin powder, BART, right? Right down. Yeah. Because it wasn't a bunch of spot buyers that came in and was like, you know, I need Bitcoin now. There's a bunch of people on finance, CME, yeah. and whatever. So derivatives are net neutral over the long term. Um, if we think about, can governments come in and say, oh, you know, we're going to suppress the price of Bitcoin like we did with gold. Well, the thing with gold is, you know, I have it in my vault in London, yeah. right? And you're a buyer in New York. Are you going to get, or, or, you know, somewhere internationally, or, you know, I'm a buyer in New York and my gold's in Chicago. And are you going to demand custody of it? I mean, maybe if you want to hire, a, you know, an armed, <laughs> an armed brigade to yeah. give you the gold and you store it in your vault and men with guns and Bitcoin, it's, it's, you know, cost two bucks to move a billion yeah. and it's verifiable and you have custody mathematically in 10 minutes and even, yeah. even quicker. And so the, the dislocations that arise in, in derivative markets in Bitcoin that have arised in the past and will arise in the future, they'll definitely try you know, long, short, whatever, Mm -hmm. but they'll get resolved and often violently. So like, if you just look at like CME, right? Paper futures, treasuries as collateral, dollars settled, the Bitcoin market, Mm -hmm. not perpetuals, but the calendar futures. When FTX collapsed, the price was 5% under the Bitcoin spot price for Mm -hmm. CME futures. Mm -hmm. And what happened after? I'm not saying they were the only driver of Bitcoin going up, but why couldn't they continue to push Bitcoin down? Mm-hmm. Right, they the people that shorted into the dirt 
people that sold Bitcoin at $15,000 when the spot Bitcoin price was $15,500, mm -hmm. they had to buy higher, right. right? Even though it was cash settled, right. they still had to buy higher. Yeah. So on a net, on a net basis, it's neutral. Um, and, and oftentimes at, you know, the top of the market, Bitcoin would have reached $64,000, 69,000 without the futures market. Yeah. It also wouldn't have touched 15,000 on the way down. Right. So as a net neutral, we're going to just amplify. It amplifies volatility, volatility yeah. in an extremely inelastic right. asset. An asset that already has extreme volatility because of perfect supply and elasticity. Yeah. And it just throws fuel on that fire. Like, it's absolutely yeah. scarce, 21 million. Yeah. But the, the flow, especially preceding bear, uh, bull markets, yeah. is so, so, so tightly held that like in theory, it's a $500 billion market cap. You should be able to take 10, you know, in theory, yeah. you should be able to take $10 billion and get a, get a chunk. Yeah. Try, try putting $10 billion yeah. into the Bitcoin market right now. <laughs> you can't. Right. That's so. a good point. Uh, okay, I have kept you too long. We've actually got to get, I've got to get to a panel. So that flew by. I didn't yeah, get to hardly any of my questions. <laughs> we'll have to do it again. Um, thank you for doing this. Dylan, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, you can just find me on Twitter uh, at Dylan LeClaire underscore. Um, all my stuff's there. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you having me. I'm sorry I, I rambled on and didn't let you get to the question. No, no, no. Very useful information. I'm glad you rambled on. Uh, we just had a tight time one today. So that means we'll have to record again. We shall. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks, man.